In this video, I am going to be talking about what your attorney needs to do to win your domestic violence case during cross-examination. My name is Veronica. I am a criminal defense attorney here in Los Angeles, and I help people who have been arrested put their criminal cases behind them so that they can enjoy their lives and their freedom. And again, in this video, I'm going to be talking about what your attorney needs to do in order to have a, an effective cross-examination at trial in your domestic violence case. Because in domestic violence cases, cross-examination is where it's at. You know, you can go up there as a defendant and tell your side of it and say, hey, no, I didn't hit her or she hit me first. I was just trying to restrain her. But if your attorney doesn't do a good job of attacking her credibility, frankly, you are not going to win that case. So let's talk about this. Now, when I do cross-examination and when I first started doing this, um, I realized that many times my clients would tell me, and still today they tell me, you know, she's lying. I didn't do it. I didn't do what she's saying I did. You know, either she attacked me first or simply we were arguing, but there was, there was no domestic violence at all. And I'll ask them, well, why, why would she, why would she lie about you? You know, that's a pretty extreme thing to do, right? Get somebody that you loved or at least liked, um, in some way arrested, right? Have them sent to jail to the absolute misery that is jail, um, have to bond out, spend thousands of dollars, potentially go back to jail or go to prison. I mean, you are ruining their life. Why, <laughs> right? Like what, why would you do that? What would her reason be? And many of them say like, I don't really know. I don't know exactly. Um, so I started realizing that I needed to delve deep. If I wanted to win these cases for my clients, I needed to delve deep and figure out why these women are lying, if in fact they are. Um, so I started talking to my clients about their relationships, about how things ended, what they were arguing about, and sometimes I'd be like, all right, well, you didn't know why she was angry, but I can tell you exactly why she was angry. Um, and they sometimes, like, they just don't know. I think it's sometimes hard to, you know, just have that perspective. And it's not just guys, of course. <laughs> I'm sure I could tell you about some argument I had with my boyfriend where I think he's totally wrong, and you're like, no, actually, Veronica, you should have, you know, you really screwed up in this particular way. Um, so it is important to know what people are angry about so that I can cross-examine them on it. Sometimes I can make them angry again in front of the jury, which can help. Um, sometimes I can show their motive to lie. Because the jury is wondering the same thing too, right? Why would somebody make up this story or exaggerate a story in a way that will ruin someone's life? And that is a difficult hurdle to overcome. The burden is supposed to be on the prosecution. Uh, but in reality, when you're sitting there and you have somebody saying, yeah, I was abused, and you don't really have any holes poked in that person's story, it can be difficult as a defendant to win. So in my experience, um, there are s seven basic reasons why I have found that victims lie that sometimes my client, their ex, doesn't even know about. Um, number one is that he that they are angry that he cheated or mistreated her. You know, I've had clients who they did cheat at some point, but now they're back together or they were back together for a while. They thought everything was good. All of a sudden they have this domestic violence charge against them after a fight and they're like, well, I thought that was, we were done with that. You forgave me. Well, it looks like she didn't, right? Or, you know, there can be other ways to mistreat someone too, but that's a really big one where they think, oh, that's in the past, but for her, it is not necessarily in the past. And I know I'm using him and her. Of course, it can go both ways. I've had female clients accused of domestic violence as well, but that's what I'm using here because um, not only is it a little bit easier for me instead of saying they and them the whole time and making it confusing, but most of my domestic violence clients are men. Um, and I do think that I have a little bit of an edge sometimes in figuring out what these women are thinking, just being a woman. So, um, and perhaps they think that too, which is why I have so many clients that are men accused of domestic violence. Um, number two um, is that the woman is really upset and I would say in many cases insulted that the guy dumped her. Um, 
you know, one of my early cases that we took to trial and we won, my client had no idea. Yeah, he broke up with her, but he thought, well, she didn't really want to be with me either. The relationship wasn't going very well. I don't think that's really why she would do this. So I start looking up this girl. I'm looking up her Instagram and I see that this is someone who really, um, really sees herself as you know, a princess, a queen, someone who really has very high regard for herself. And I don't necessarily mean that she has healthy self-esteem. Maybe she is insecure on the inside and probably, right, to make something up like this. But um, this is somebody who is like, no, you don't dump me. I dump you. And that's just, you could tell the way that she carried herself, her pictures, the captions, that this is how she was. And actually, I used that on cross-examination and actually had some text messages as well where um, it was clear that he was dumping her, but she was insisting, no, 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 I dumped him. Like, what are you talking about? That little guy, he, he didn't dump me, I dumped him. And she got really angry with me and I had those text messages there. And my client had no idea that that's the reason for all of this. He just was like, well, she went crazy, I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> number three is a way to keep him around, have some kind of power over him. I actually see this one quite a bit, you know, they are breaking up, things are not going well, um, the police are called, he's arrested, and now maybe there's a restraining order on him, but she can contact him, but he can't contact her, and if he responds to her, now that's a violation of a restraining order, so now she has more dirt on him, so he has to keep being nice to her, and coming back to her, and doing what she wants. Uh, uh, those are sometimes the worst and you know I always tell my clients like just don't really just don't don't respond I mean it's probably best for this to be in the past but especially when you don't have kids together or you know the relationship is it it's done it's not like you're married it, this is something that maybe was a few months and this person got you arrested they lied about you and now they're they know that you can't respond to them but they're sending you all these messages that is not a good sign and in so many of those cases eventually if the case goes on for long enough that girl's probably going to turn on you and those text messages are going to make their way over to the prosecution and now all of a sudden you're going to have violating a protective order sometimes dissuading a witness if you said if she said hey should i come to court today and you're like no i think it would be better if you didn't come to court okay now dissuading a witness that's a felony strike offense that's a prison offense um, but so that's a big one. Number four is that some people enjoy all of the attention that comes with being a victim. So whatever the reason was for you to first get arrested, maybe it was even that the neighbors called the cops and then the cops come out. Maybe she doesn't really say much against you. Um, but you are arrested and now she's getting treated by everyone by they're going to assign her a victim advocate, the cops are treating her like a victim, maybe she tells family and friends, okay, she's a victim there too. Um, some people really enjoy that. Uh, we can all see this with Amber Heard. Remember, like, do you remember? I remember, I never believed that woman. Um, that Like, how she was with the Me Too stuff. Like, she, it wasn't just like, okay, I'm a he abused me, I want him arrested, or I don't want to be with him, I want a divorce. It was like, she enjoyed talking about it, telling these stories about it, giving interviews about it, pushing this Me Too movement. And I don't believe that she was a victim, but some people just really like that attention. Number five is sometimes they were emotional at the time. So at the time, maybe there was an argument, they were really angry. Sometimes we learned people are drinking, using whatever substance, tell the cops, yeah, he hit me. And maybe that's true, Maybe, but maybe she hit you first, like whatever it is. So at first she made some kind of statement and then later on feels bad and knows, okay, well that wasn't true, but she's afraid of getting in trouble. So that that's a big thing in these cases. And you know, the prosecution doesn't do anything to make them feel like 
well, you, you won't get in trouble. The prosecution subpoenas them, calls them aggressively sometimes, makes it seem like, hey, you have to be in court or there's going to be a warrant for your arrest. You have to testify. You're forced to do this. And they think, well, if I tell the truth, then maybe I'll have charges against me for perjury or filing a false police report. I will tell you that I've never seen the DA's office in Los Angeles do that ever in these cases. They don't want to do it. They don't do it. Number six is custody issues. I mean, this is a really big one, especially if like a divorce is imminent and everybody's kind of moving out or still in the house trying to make it work. Custody issues and property issues, frankly, with the house. And, you know, if you get somebody arrested, there's a there's a protective order, get them kicked out. Maybe now you have a leg up on keeping the house. That's really huge. Um, the last one is immigration issues, whether I mean, sometimes if you were, I'm not an immigration lawyer, but my understanding is that if you are a victim of um, a crime, especially domestic violence crime, now you potentially will get to remain here when otherwise you may not have been able to. And I, I mean, I've seen cases where that didn't actually work out for people, but that is their idea that it would work out. So, I mean, it's kind of hard to understand, like, you're going to get someone arrested that you you care about just so that you can stay in the country. But I think in many of those cases, first of all, not everyone is a nice or honest person, but I also think that um, the relationship's already going south. Maybe he did cheat on you or did something where you think, you know what, he, he deserves it. Um, and then, you know, and sometimes it's a combination where then maybe you change your mind later, but you're afraid of getting in trouble, especially in that sort of situation. Um, anyway, I hope that you found this helpful, but these kinds of exercises are something that every attorney should be doing in the case, not just asking their client, hey, like, why would she lie about you, but really trying to think about it because sometimes they just don't know. And as an outside party, sometimes it's a lot easier for us to figure that out than it may be for our clients. Um, anyway, if you have a case in California that you need help with, feel free to book a call, call with me. You can... Um, click on the link down below or you can find my number there.